Good evening, uh, everyone. I'm really, really thrilled uh, that you're all here and that, uh, uh, that we've had this opportunity to come together in, uh, in several homes of some of our faculty and to discuss a, an extraordinarily important, uh, influential, and I think um, a, a wonderful reading for reflection um, on, uh, on, on what it is to be a Christian. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Patrick Deneen, and I am the, uh, I think, I think it's the title is Acting Director or Interim Director. I like to say Acting Director because no one can be Carter, you can only act. I didn't even wear my, <laughs> didn't even wear my uh, scarf tonight, so I'm falling down on the job. Uh, but I am serving as Director for the Center of Ethic, uh, for Ethics and Culture this sem just this semester. Uh, I teach in the Political Science Department here at Notre Dame. Um, but it's been really my pleasure uh, for a very brief interim period uh, to serve as acting director, in part because um, I had free reign to sort of try to create a few new initiatives, and I really wanted to focus my brief time at the center on a few student initiatives, uh, one of which I think my, a number of you may have attended the other night, uh, uh, an initiative we called The Book That Changed My Life, in which we invited a, uh, a professor here on campus to come and talk about a significant book uh, in their lives. If you notice the symbol of the center, uh, this is not a book that's been lit on fire, I hope, <laughs> but a book that's supposed to light a fire in you. And we heard from Professor David O'Connor, who talked about uh, uh, The Lord of the Rings. And for those of you who attended that event, it was really, truly uh, an inspiring uh, and, a, a, and really marvelous uh, discussion. Uh, so, and the second program that I envision is this one, which was uh, to try to bring together, really build, a, a, from in my view, on the Soren Fellows dinner uh, evenings. Uh, I've hosted a number of those and really enjoyed having students over to our house uh, and having discussions, but one element that I thought might be built upon was that we didn't really have something common to talk about. So you'd have sort of a group of students who would arrive and you wouldn't know who they were and they were never in that combination before and might never be in that combination again. And so most of the evening was sort of spent saying, who are you and what do you do and what's your major and what are you studying, which is interesting. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice for us to do something like that, but instead of just having a meal together, um, having a group of students together and talk about something that we had read together. Uh, and then to culminate that uh, with uh, a lecture. So to to have a discussion, a small discussion at faculty homes, and then have a, uh, have a, um, a kind of culminating moment. Uh, and, and we thought of the name the Soren Salon. It had a nice ring to it. Uh, and and I, I can speak for myself that uh, the, the evening that uh, uh, when I hosted several of you, and I see a number of you here, was really a, a marvelous discussion. Uh, I thought uh, really a model of, of what I've always thought college should be, which is just simply a love of discussion and learning and probing and examining. Um, and uh, not because there's a grade involved and not because you're gonna be assessed at the end of it because that's just what it is to be a human being. And to be fully a human being is simply uh, to want to know and to know in order uh, to know the truth. Uh, and so it was for me a great pleasure to have and to host uh, a number of you, and I've heard from uh, the other faculty who also hosted that they had also similarly marvelous times. I want to thank especially Professor uh, Jenny Martin, who's able to be with us tonight, um, uh, as well as Professors uh, Dan Philpot and Sam Bray. Sam Bray, who just joined our law school faculty, so we really got him early uh, to host, uh, host a group. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, just, I would ask you to join uh, me in thanking, for, for just for, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, Professor Martin, but also those who aren't here, just for hosting, hosting you all. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So, and I'm, I'll be I'm very pleased and anticipating uh, uh, introducing our guest tonight, uh, Micah Watson, a, a professor at Calvin College, and I'll do that uh, a little bit later on. But for now, why don't, uh, why don't we bow our heads and uh, say, say a prayer before we have our meal. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Loving God, we ask you to bless all those gathered here today as we come together in friendship and in fellowship. Thank you for the blessings of our individual and our collective God-given gifts. Place in our hearts the desire to make a difference for our families, for our community, for our university, and for our nation, and to the many cultures and peoples around the world. Give us balance in times of distraction and uncertainty. Help us to move toward our goals with determination, but also with an abundant sense of humor. Thank you for this food in a world where many know only hunger, for our faith in a world where many know fear, for friends in a world where many know only loneliness. Please bless this food we are about to share 
Bless those who have prepared it and those who serve it, and those who have worked to make today this occasion and this gathering that we enjoy tonight. For all this, we give you thanks. Bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, and with that, we'll have a bit of table talk, and we'll turn over to the program in a little while. Thank you. Uh, privilege to introduce a, a longtime friend, uh, Professor Micah Watson, who's uh, an associate professor of political science at Calvin College up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I had actually thought of inviting him around this time of year because I thought, well, given that it's late February, there's more certainty he'd be able to get here because he'd be able to drive in what's usually wintry weather. Of course, it's a beautiful spring-like day, so uh, you can go back, Mike. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, he joined the faculty there uh, in the fall of 2015. Uh, his research interests are, are, are wide and diverse, political philosophy, politics and religion, politics and literature, ethics and public policy, and constitutional jurisprudence. Hey, did you steal my areas of interest? Uh, he completed his undergraduate degree at University of California at Davis and earned an MA at, in church state studies at Baylor University. Uh, he holds an MA and doctorate degrees uh, from, in politics from Princeton University. And I got to know Mike. I was an assistant professor at Princeton when, when he was a, a, a graduate student. I actually served on his dissertation defense committee, so he's uh, continuing to pay me kickbacks for that uh, favor. Professor Watson's current research agenda includes ongoing projects and misguided projects on John Locke and a, <laughs> and a collaborative effort uh, with his political theory counterparts at Wheaton and Westmont to consider the possibility of an evangelical tradition in political thought. But especially relevant to tonight's discussion, Professor Watson is the co-author of a, of a book published in 2016 along with Justin Dyer, which is entitled C.S. Lewis on Politics and the Natural Law. Uh, that book, as it's described, is, uh, ranges uh, in its inquiry uh, from the depths of Lewis's philosophical treatments of epistemology and moral pedagogy to practical considerations of morals legislation and responsible citizenship and explores the, concert, the contours of Lewis's multifaceted Christian engagement with political philosophy generally and the natural law tradition in particular. And I think uh, it was a, a unique contribution. One tends not to think of C.S. Lewis as a political thinker and as a natural law thinker. So I, I think uh, uh, Professor Watson and Professor Dyer did a really signal uh, contribution in producing this book. Um, and having said that, uh, I was told by Professor Watson when I invited him that he's never actually given a lecture before on the weight of glory. So I think we're in for a, a first time I hope, I hope it's up to the standards that we expect, uh, but it's, it's with great pleasure uh, that I welcome my friend uh, and uh, um, very much uh, my, my now new relative neighbor up in Grand Rapids, uh, Michael Watts. Well, thank you very much. Living in Michigan, I'm always glad for a chance to go south in February. Yeah, well, no, it's pretty nice today. Um, and I am, I am grateful to be here. Um, I am grateful for Notre Dame. I am grateful uh, for the Catholic intellectual tradition of the Catholic Church. I can say that as a separated brother, I hope. Um, I'm grateful for your presence in our culture. I'm also great to, grateful to have had Patrick uh, on my committee and as someone I could go to at Princeton when I was trying to figure things out. Um, and what a coup that Notre Dame uh, has Patrick Deneen among many other great faculty, but I know Patrick well and have learned a great deal from him, though from his perspective, as you may have noted, not enough uh, on some subjects. So thank you, Patrick, thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm grateful for the invitation, but I have been given a tough job because I am supposed to give a talk about another talk which is resplendent. Lewis's sermon is amazing, and so giving a, giving a talk about another talk that has been so, uh, so well received is a, is a bit of a challenge. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give a little bit of background, maybe some things that you may not know um, about the sermon, and then I'm going to uh, conclude with four preachy questions, preachy questions, preachy observations, preachy questions uh, for us to, to consider. So let me start off tonight with a letter that Lewis wrote on June 11th, 1934. He writes, Dear Madam, Thank you for your letter. You make too much of a very trifling service. If I, have, if I am ever in those parts, which is unlikely, I will certainly brave the terrors of convents. 
and accept your kind hospitality. Yours sincerely, C.S. Lewis. Those parts of which Lewis speaks are actually these parts, by which I mean northern Indiana. And by terrors of convents, Lewis is referring to the convents nearby at St. Mary's College. <laughs> Although he is quoting from his correspondent, so the description terrors is not from him. His correspondent, the madam, who had offered the invitation and hospitality was, as some of you may already know, anyone can guess? All right, may not know, Sister Madaliva, okay, who took on the presidency of St. Mary's College in 1934 and had a rather remarkable tenure through 1961. Sister Madaliva had done some postgraduate work at Oxford and had attended a number of Lewis's lectures on medieval literature and philosophy. Lewis had to miss three lectures due to illness, and she had very much been looking forward to his lecture on Boethius, and so she let him know that, and he responded by doing three lectures on Boethius. She tells us in her autobiography that she wrote to Lewis, and he responded by doing those three lectures. Not only that, but he let her borrow his notebooks and then described for her his method of going about doing his lectures and gave her a bibliography for her further study. This is the trifling service that Lewis mentioned in response to Sister Madaliva's thank you note. Lewis and Sister Madaliva would correspond off and on throughout the 1950s, with Lewis thanking her for her work on Chaucer and giving her high praise for her autobiography, My First 70 Years, which I think is a great title for an autobiography, <laughs> which he appeared to enjoy very much. He invited her to visit himself and his wife Joy at Oxford, and she invited him again to come visit South Bend. She also invited him to become a sponsor of St. Mary's. I'm not exactly sure what that is. I asked one of my Catholic friends and he didn't know either. So if one of you knows what that means, you can let me know. He politely declined saying he didn't know enough about it and, and, and couldn't do it. But, he, but it was interesting that she did invite him. His last letter to her was October 3rd, 1963, some six weeks before he died on November 22nd, 1963, the same day that JFK went down to an assassin's bullet in Dallas, and also the same day that Brave New World author Aldous Huxley died as well. In his letter to her, he quoted Dante's Paradiso in the original, which I will not try and reproduce. The English translation is, in his will is our peace, about his mortality. Lewis never did make it to Indiana or to the United States. The closest he got was marrying an American and becoming the stepfather to two young American boys. But I think it is safe to say he would have been delighted to know that Notre Dame students have had a meeting already at the homes of their professors and now have a, a meeting tonight to talk about a sermon that he delivered on June 8th, 1941 at Oxford's University Church, the Church of St. Mary the Virgin. That particular church, if you know your English Reformation history, was the site of some of the most awful things that have happened between Catholics and Protestants before we stopped killing each other. So I suspect he'd be rather particularly pleased to know that you have invited a professor from Calvin College <laughs> to have a conversation together about a sermon from an Anglican Oxford Don considered in light of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition. We have a long way to go yet, but we've also come a long way. So speaking of conversations, George Sayer, one of Lewis's first students, later a friend and author of one of the earliest biographies of Lewis, tells us about his first conversation with Lewis. He writes, as I walked away from new buildings, by the way, Oxford's new buildings were finished in 1458, <laughs> I found the man that Lewis had called Tollers, sitting on one of the stone steps in front of the arcade. How did you get on, he asked. I think rather well. I think he will be a most interesting tutor to have. Interesting. Yes, he's certainly that, said the man who I later learned was J.R.R. Tolkien. You'll never get to the bottom of him. Well, Tolkien may as well have been speaking to all of us, as I don't think anybody is truly going to get to the bottom of C.S. Lewis. Nevertheless, it is fun to try. And usually we can speak of three C.S. Lewises. There is the imaginative literary fellow who wrote children's stories and science fiction and theological speculative fantasy and reimagined Greek mythology. And I suspect many of us in this room first encountered C.S. Lewis by way of four English school children who find their way into an enchanted world with a parcel carrying fawn, talking beavers, a white witch, and a majestic lion. There is also the Christian apologist 
and logical thinker C.S. Lewis, the author of Mere Christianity, Miracles, The Problem of Pain and the Abolition of Man, the founding president of the Oxford Socratic Club, and the debater who took on all comers to defend the faith. These are the two most famous versions of C.S. Lewis, but there is a third C.S. Lewis, and that is the professor and the scholar. The man who, as a boy, had written a review of Paradise Lost at age 10, who knew Latin, Greek, Italian, and French before he started his studies at Oxford, the student who took two different degrees at Oxford in English and Classics, earning a triple first, a student so accomplished that at that time it would have been deemed a distraction or a demotion for him to earn a PhD, and so he skipped that step and went straight into teaching and scholarship at Oxford, <laughs> teaching scores of students and writing several in-the-weeds works of literary criticism. If you've ever been tempted to think of Lewis as a second-rate intellect or merely a children's author, ask yourself how accomplished a scholar needs to be for Cambridge University to create a chair in medieval and Renaissance studies just to steal that scholar away from Oxford University. <laughs> we do well to listen to Lewis because of all the Lewises, the imaginative storyteller, the logical Christian apologist with a knack for making hard things easier to understand, and the accomplished and brilliant scholar who could so keenly observe our modern times, in part because he had inhabited the literature and philosophy of the classical and medieval eras. But tonight we're gathering to talk about a fourth C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis the preacher, Lewis the dedicated member of the Church of England. We don't focus on Lewis's Anglicanism in large part because he did not, though it says something that evangelicals from my tribe are always trying to claim him as an evangelical, which doesn't make much sense. And some of my Roman Catholic friends like to think that if he just lived a little bit longer, <laughs> He would have come home and followed G.K. Chesterton and joined his friend Tolkien and, and many others. Lewis, <laughs> Lewis didn't like to talk about the differences among Christians very much, particularly in public. After all, he was an exponent of mere Christianity. In a letter to Don B. Griffiths, Benedictine a monk to whom Lewis had dedicated his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, and when Lewis was fact-checking mere Christianity, this was his Catholic source he had sent the book to to make sure he wasn't stepping on too many toes, he writes this, I am no nearer to your church than I was, but don't feel inclined to reopen a discussion. I think it only widens and sharpens differences. Also, I've had enough of it on the opposite flank lately, having fallen among a new type to me, bigoted and proselytizing Quakers. <laughs> I really think that in our days, it is the undogmatic and liberal people who call themselves Christians that are most arrogant and intolerant. I expect justice and even courtesy from many atheists, and much more from your people. From modernists, I have come to take bitterness and rancor as a matter of course. Fortunately, Lewis's sermons have been, for the most part, very well received, without much bitterness or rancor. His sermons are not particularly Anglican. We know that he preached at least 11 times, and we have the texts of seven of those sermons, or at least those sermons as they made their way into printed essays. The first sermon he preached was also at St. Mary the Virgin and was delivered on October 22, 1939. The last sermon that we know about was delivered in 1947. Now, we could choose a number of places to begin our story of how Lewis came to preach this second sermon, the one we're talking about tonight. But for symmetry's sake, I think we should start exactly 85 years ago this evening, February 27th, 1933. On that day, Lewis wrote a letter to Guy Pocock, who was his editor for the first book that Lewis wrote after his conversion to Christianity. On this day, 85 years ago, Lewis was sick with the flu, writing that he was practically an idiot, but he needed to correct a couple things in the manuscript and go over the legal contract which had required him to say that his next so-and-so book would go with the same publisher. All these mundane details. The letter is actually not all that exciting. What's important about the letter is not the details. What's important about the letter was the book. And the book was called The Pilgrim's Regress. Not only was it the first book that Lewis wrote as a Christian, it was his first work of fiction and the first that he published in his own name. He'd done some books of poetry but used his, uh, his mother's maiden name to publish under. It was also, Lewis later acknowledged, too obscure and rather pointed. This is kind of angry Lewis when he was younger. It was written in two weeks and riffs off of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress in an autobiographical account of Lewis's conversion story. 
It assumes a working knowledge of Aristotle, Kant, Spinoza, Hegel, and Nietzsche, <laughs> and contains nearly 300 references and allusions and quotations from no less than six different languages. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was this book that caught the eye of the Reverend Theodore Richard Milford, who was the vicar of St. Mary the Virgin in Oxford, who was so impressed with the book that he invited Lewis to give his first sermon in 1939, and then again in June 1941, when he delivered the weight of glory to a packed house. As a side note, uh, uh, Reverend Milford is also the founder of Oxfam, some of you may know about. He's uh, very involved at first president in the 1940s. But the connection goes deeper than just the details of the invitation. One of the primary themes in the pilgrim's regress is desire. And Lewis's pilgrim is motivated over and over again by a sense of longing. Even when he thinks he has found what he thought he wanted, he is disappointed, but not disillusioned. And the wanting draws him further and further down the path until he eventually meets Mother Kirk, which is the church. If you haven't read The Pilgrim's Regress, I would recommend it. Uh, it is, it's tough sledding in places in terms of the illusions, but it's well worth the effort. All joy, Lewis wrote in a letter, as distinct from mere pleasure, still more amusement, emphasizes our pilgrim status, always reminds, always beckons, it awakens desire. Our best havings are wantings. You'll recognize this theme from the sermon itself. Lewis's account of his conversion, both in the pilgrim's regress and in his straightforward autobiography, Surprised by Joy, testifies again and again to his sense that our longings speak to us of the inconsolable secret that we are shy about, a secret we cannot hide and cannot tell. We cannot tell it because we have not had it, but we cannot hide it because we cannot help but want it. And yet we are not entirely sure of what it is except that we get hints and shimmers and sense of it in the good earthly things that God has provided for us. The sense of longing also played a pivotal role in Lewis's apologetics, as in mere Christianity. I would almost say that Lewis treats this longing as the flip side to the problem of evil, whereas the problem of evil poses a significant challenge to Christian believers, existentially if not strictly logically. The problem of longing poses an explanatory problem to those who see and confirm a universe stripped of meaning and transcendence. How is it we still long for meaning in a meaningless universe? And now I've arrived at the actual sermon itself. And so I'm out of tricks, for I've given you perhaps some details that you may not have known before about the sermon and about Lewis's life and how the sermon came to be. But what to say about a message that is so well-crafted, well-written, and beloved and that you've already gone over with your own professors for a couple hours, all right? This is the challenge of studying Lewis. One is tempted when giving talks about him just to string together a series of quotations from what he's written. <laughs> I will end that way just to, to <laughs> spoil it for you. We could draw out some other details from the sermon, some rather esoteric details like Lewis's dual meaning and mentioning the morning star. Maybe in that passage where he talks about God giving us the morning star, if you get up early enough, you can go out and enjoy it. Why? Because the morning star refers to Venus, historically. And Lewis, if you haven't read Planet Narnia, if you're a Lewis fan, Planet Narnia is about how every Narnia book is corresponding to one of the seven planets in the, in the medieval cosmology. Um, and, and so morning star refers to Venus. Morning star is also one of the biblical names for Jesus in both Revelation and Second Peter. We could talk about that. If you want to get into the esoteric, and Lewis does hide Easter eggs uh, in lots of different places. We could also note Lewis's distinction between natural and mercenary rewards as related to certain goods, and how his distinction there bears a strong resemblance to a similar distinction regarding internal and external goods and practices made by another well-known 20th century thinker and convert to Christianity in his book, After Virtue. We could also talk about what the sermon means for Lewis's politics. That's what I'm usually asked to talk about. I'm actually going to steer away from that. I'm happy to talk about it later. It's kind of a relief not to talk about politics for a moment. Because he does put politics in its place, right, in his conclusion to the sermon. All politics must be seen through the light of our eternal destiny. What I'd like to do instead is think a little bit with you about Lewis's argument and what it means for us personally after hearing it and mulling it over. For we cannot forget that this is a sermon. And unlike a straightforward lecture or an interpretive essay or a polemic, a sermon is meant to not only tell us what we should know, but also what we should do and how we should live 
given what we know. It is eminently practical. So I have four observations I want to make about Lewis's sermon, about what we should know and how we should live, paired with four questions to ponder. These are not exhaustive. There are other questions and observations, and hopefully you have made some of those. But they're the ones I came up with, so here goes. The first thread that I think we see running through Lewis's sermon is just how very good the world is, how much we are meant to enjoy it, how good it is to sit together and have a good meal together. Lewis emphasized, first and foremost, the goodness of the created world, and only secondarily, the fallenness of it. The, the fallenness is completely derivative of the goodness that was already there. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That is why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. We may think this rather crude and unspiritual. God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. Lewis certainly lived this out. The more you can know how Lewis lived his day-to-day -day life, the more you realize how much fun he had. <laughs> there was a, you've heard of Bob Jones University. Um, Bob Jones Sr., a Christian fundamentalist, Protestant, uh, no cards, no dancing, no tobacco, no going with girls who do all that stuff, a very strict sort of fellow, went and visited Lewis. And Lewis, not knowing about that particular teetotalism, took him to a pub. <laughs> and Bob Jones, to his credit, when he got back, his statement was, the man smokes and the man drinks, but I do believe he is a Christian. <laughs> uh, another anecdote that I find uh, just kind of wonderful. Um, the Daily Telegraph did a, did a piece on, on Lewis uh, during, his, uh, during his life and referred to him as the ascetic Mr. Lewis, to which Tolkien wrote his friend, I ask you, he put away three pints in a very short session we had this morning and said he was going short for Lent. <laughs> three pints, morning, Lent. Okay, the, the, he, he, he enjoyed the gifts that God has given us. And he prioritized the good pleasures of the world over and against, to some extent, the fasting, the abstinence, and self-denial. The latter are crucial, but only as means to an end. The former are not themselves the end, the pleasures are not the end, but they are signposts, hints, foretastes of the genuine joy that is to come. We can only properly enjoy the good when we take the good as it was meant to be on the terms created for it. Channeling Augustine, Lewis says the rightness of things depends on how they are ordered. Elsewhere, Lewis, channeling Aristotle, says the devil sends errors into the world in pairs, hoping we'll fall into one error through our dislike of the other. The faith Lewis champions in the weight of glory is in one sense a hedonistic one, one in which the transitory pleasures of this world are meant to whet our appetites for the true and permanent pleasure and joy of knowing God himself without an intermediary someday. And here, you don't have to take Lewis's word for it, you can listen to Screwtape. Okay, Screwtape is the demon that he created. The only book that Lewis didn't enjoy, writing. He loved to write, but he found writing Screwtape dry and gritty and going, as any Christian should, because he's trying to adopt the perspective of hell. Here's what Screwtape says. He's a hedonist at heart, God. All those fasts and vigils and stakes and crosses are only a facade, only like foam on the seashore. Out at sea, out in his sea, there is pleasure and more pleasure he makes no secret of it. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Ugh! I don't think he has the least inkling of that high and austere mystery to which we rise in the miserific vision. He's vulgar, Wormwood. He has a bourgeois mind. He has filled his world full of pleasures. There are things for humans to do all day long without his minding in the least. Sleeping, washing, eating, drinking, making love, playing, praying, working. Everything has to be twisted before it's any use to us. Well, this leads me to my preachy question. In a culture that is built almost entirely on fulfilling our current desires for immediate pleasure, consumption, and, a, and to borrow from Rousseau, and a more proper one-upsmanship, one in which everything sacred and secular seems susceptible to becoming yet one more commodity on the market, what dispositions and practices do we need to live joyful, vibrant, glory-seeking lives without falling into the patterns of the world on the one hand, or retreating into a dour-faced, world-rejecting, and resentful posture on the other? First question. Second observation. Lewis assumes that there is an authority that we are subject to, 
And so it comes to the hard aspects of our faith. He dives deeper into them rather than using scissors to cut and paste what he likes and doesn't like in our faith. In The Weight of Glory, he says, the scriptural imagery about heaven puts him off rather than attracts him. But the difference is that the scriptural imagery has authority, Lewis writes. It comes to us from writers who are closer to God than we, and it has stood the test of Christian experience down the centuries, end quote. Lewis writes that if our faith is objective, we should expect that those puzzling or repellent elements are precisely those elements we don't yet understand but need to. If the religion we follow has no elements that puzzle or repel us, nothing about it that leads us to say, well, that's hard, and I don't understand it, but it's part of the faith, so I accept it. If there's nothing like that in our faith, we may well wonder if Freud was right about us. And instead of God creating us in his image, we instead have crafted a God and a religion in our own image. Which leads to my second preachy question. Lewis concludes in, near the end that our charity must be a real and costly love with deep feeling for the sins in spite of which we love the sinner. No mere tolerance or indulgence which parodies love as flippancy parodies merriment. What do we find puzzling or difficult to accept in our faith? What are we tempted to downplay or discard because a doctrine or a teaching is personally difficult for us or runs entirely counter to the zeitgeist and what it's preaching at the moment? What sins of our own or of others are we tempted to water down or excuse? Second preaching question. Third observation. Speaking of repellent doctrines, Lewis is unapologetic about the reality of hell. In fact, when he writes, hell is always capitalized because he thinks it's a real place. For the most part, he emphasizes the positive draw of heaven. The pangs and longings we have for true joy make the positive alluring case for heaven. It will be so good, so beyond our wildest imaginings that we will want to be a part of it. We want to be let in. We want the secret answered. The wound healed it is a powerful, attractive vision, and Lewis articulates it beautifully. But Lewis does not shy away from the alternative either. Not in this sermon, nor in his other works. He does not go in for fire and brimstone. Despite his love for Dante, he does not rely on horror-filled imagery to motivate us to consider Christ. But Lewis understood himself to be bound to authority. And the figure who speaks most about hell in all of scripture is Jesus Christ. Just as we are powerfully drawn to the possibility of God someday saying to us, well done, good and faithful servant, so should we be mindful of those terrifying words we find in the very same book, I never knew you, depart from me. So preachy question number three. If we, can, if we are far too easily pleased with the tepid pleasures on offer when compared to true joy, think about how Lewis opens up the sermon, can we also be far too complacent about the reality of hell? If our forefathers and foremothers in the faith perhaps overemphasized it at times, might we be in danger of ignoring it? A danger that applies not only to ourselves but to our neighbors. Right, final observation. Lewis begins and concludes his sermon with love. Love is not unselfishness. It is not standing back. It is not abstinence. Love is active. Love is incarnation. Love is crucifixion, resurrection, and eventually consummation. And the stakes are enormous. Lewis's rousing conclusion reminds us of the infinite worth of each human being, a worth predicated not on intellect, nor capacity to feel pain or plan for a future or an economic value, but simply by virtue of the reality that we are made and loved by our creator. Our love for God cannot help but bleed out into our love of neighbor. Lewis's point is that everything that we do has to be seen in this light. Our first parents broke the vertical relationship we enjoyed with God in the cool of the garden, and their expulsion was the result. We see the bitter fruits of the horizontal breaking of that relationship with Cain and Abel. It is no accident that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength, the vertical aspect. And the second commandment is like it, to love our neighbors as ourselves, horizontal. It is no accident that Jesus refers to the same dynamic in his parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, highlighting both the allure of heaven and the terrible reality of hell, and telling us that what we do for the least of these, we do for him, linking the two commandments. It is no accident that Lewis concludes with those two similar dynamics. My last preachy question. Lewis's conclusion hit home in 1941 in what Lewis considered a post-Christian England. Lewis was sounding the alarm about our culture 70, 80 years ago. And we have some other folks that are doing the same now following in his stead. Uh, <laughs> what does it mean for us to care about the glory of our neighbor, the eternal glory 
or perhaps lack thereof? What does it mean for all of our friendships, our loves, our play, our politics? Are we really willing to risk looking stupid or old-fashioned or bigoted? What does it mean for us to see our neighbor as sacred in a culture that is increasingly secular and inhospitable to faith? What might it cost us to speak out on behalf of and to the vulnerable, the neglected, the disposable, the, the stranger, the alienated loner? In closing, if I myself have come close to sermonizing, I apologize. I wasn't supposed to do that. My questions are as much posed to myself as they are to all of you. These are the questions that royal my mind and my heart as I read through Lewis's sermon. And in reading Lewis's call, to us, to love God and to love neighbor, I'm reminded of another passage of Lewis's, and of course, I will then quote it, which is how I conclude Lewis talks, because who better to finish with than what Lewis has written. He writes about this in The Four Loves, and in this passage, he actually takes on Augustine with fear and trembling, because Lewis recognizes Augustine's greatness, of course, but here he disagrees a little bit with Augustine. But more so, he disagrees with modernity, and modernity's emphasis or demand on assurances and safety and comfort and protected, protection and guarantees that things will all work out. He tells us instead that love is inherently risky. He writes this, there is no safe investment. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell, end quote. So our task then is to think and reason among ourselves. Is that true? Is that right? Should we know that? And if so, what should we do? How should we live in light of that truth? Thank you. Okay, so it can be about anything, right? Yeah, absolutely. yeah. That sounds good. There's a, there's a lot of Lewis. But I'm happy to give it a shot if you have questions about Lewis. Yeah. Well, you, you said you weren't going to talk about the politics, but I'm, I'm just interested. Uh, I didn't, when I didn't, when I read, <laughs> no, sure. I mean, when I read the way that Floyd said, why, uh, why don't we actually just introduce ourselves oh, yeah. by name and major and year and maybe where you're from? Social security number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right in that. Right. tells me I have to memorize it. So I get it. So I can't um, my name is Colin McCarthy. I study uh, political science and soon here. Sorry, Colin. You'll eventually be able to ask your question. My name is Colin McCarthy. Um, <laughs> so awkward. I'm a junior. <laughs> I study political science, and I'm from Maryland. Um, I'm just I'm interested in what you what you have to say about the politics. And when I read the Weight of Glory essay, I wasn't really thinking about politics, but I would like to think about yeah the relationship. Uh, so so the you know the the, the short version is um, uh, there is a book that that you could check out. It's now come out in paper book, paperback, which means it's affordable. Um, what we do, what we do in our in our book is we say that um, that Lu there's a con there's this conventional wisdom that Lewis didn't care about politics, or that he was anti-political, uh, and he actually does say quite a uh, quite a number of kind of mean things about politicians. Um, and what we argue is that uh, depending on what you mean by political, he was he was quite political. If by political what you mean is bureaucratic wrangling and log rolling and um, you know exactly what rate should the tax be and that sort of thing, then yeah, Lewis is not. A political thinker. If what you mean by political um, goes back to the root of the word political, which is polis, right, which is we get from the Greeks, which is the sense of um, how should we live together? What, what does the good life look like? How should our, our common lives be so arranged that we will become the sort of creatures we're meant to be? Then Lewis is very political. Um, but he's, he, has a particular, he has a particularly Christian approach to this. He's a natural law thinker. <laughs> 
Uh, if you've read Mere Christianity, he opens up basically with a natural law argument. His Abolition of Man book is not so much a positive case for natural law as a case for what happens if you abandon the natural law. Um, and the results from his perspective are quite terrifying. And he, make, he puts that into um, narrative, literary uh, voice in that hideous strength. Um, it, we, so Lewis was a bit of a Lockean, which I know is contested territory. Uh, he thought that um, our need for a social contract with, was natural, but that any particular social contract was not. That would be conventional. Um, he's got a bit of a libertarian streak to him without being a full libertarian. Um, he had rather um, uh, interesting views about marriage, such that Tolkien at one point wrote him a very angry letter, which he didn't send. Um, Lewis's own uh, marriage would have, was controversial um, because his wife uh, had been married before, and, um, and they got, he got married to her um, in order so she could stay in the country. Um, and then eventually they actually fell in love and they got married uh, before, before God. Um, so, yeah, Lewis's views were that the, the first things have to come first and God is first. Politics are a second thing. They're important, but they should never eclipse the first thing. That's what, that, so the last page of the sermon, everything that happens politically needs to be understood by Christians as secondary to this first thing, which is people's eternal destiny. Right? We think a lot of our country, we think of a lot of the countries that have gotten, those compared to ours are, are the lives of gnats. They're not going to last forever. Um, so, I don't know, that's kind of a ramshackle answer to that. Lewis is a Platonist and Aristotelian in many ways. Uh, he concludes the um, Chronicles of Narnia with the professor saying, you know, what are they teaching these kids in these schools these days? It's all in Plato, right? At the same time, he's more of a modern when it comes to um, equality and democracy. Uh, if you want to get a, a look at Lewis's politics, he has a, a couple of wonderful essays called Equality and Democratic Education. He believes in democracy not because he thinks everyone deserves a share in government, but because of the fall and because democracy best kind of spreads out the different power centers. Um, he, he, says, he says something kind of controversial. He says, I, I agree. Aristotle says that some people are fit to be slaves. And Lewis writes, I do not contradict him, but I reject slavery because I see no one fit to be a master. So Lewis con contrasts his view with someone like Rousseau, who thinks that we're, you know, the more people get involved, this is a kind of more positive view of human nature. And Lewis says, no, it's, it's very much a uh, fall, of, fall of man, fall of humanity sort of approach to politics. And so he's very suspicious of, um, of any pretensions to power. He's, he was very much persuaded that England was post-Christian, that Christians were trying to fix the country by introducing Christian um, teaching to the schools, were, were you know, wasting their time, uh, they needed to do something else. Uh, at the end of his life, he was actually quite despondent about democracy. He did not think it was going to, to, to last very much longer. So. I can let me keep talking about that. I can keep going. <laughs> um. Other questions? Yeah. Just to, yeah, and just to give you where, where well, you oh, yeah, yeah, there was some, sorry. This, this is just a question, the, a point you just made. If Christian teaching is not the way, according to Lewis, I think this is somewhat related to the lecture or the sermon as well, but then what is the way? Yeah, so he doesn't, he, it's not that he doesn't think Christian teaching is the way, it's that the particular efforts were being made to get Christian curriculum into the schools. And he's basically, if the teachers aren't Christians, then you can have the most Christian curriculum you like, you'd like, it's not going to work. Right, so you can have a, a Catholic or a, a reformed school, but if the professors there don't actually buy into what Catholicism is all about, then it doesn't matter how many good encyclicals you have, right, the, the real message students are gonna get is, yeah, these people don't believe this. So same thing with what at the time where it would have been England's public school system. Um, so he didn't, towards the end of his life, he writes, he writes a letter, I'm almost at dis, near despair about what to do about this politi politics stuff. He does have one practical idea that he mentions, which would, which would be a kind of a Christian voting society, and he, he the reason this stands out is because he actually says that he would be in favor of um, churches saying to their members, you need by our authority to sign on to this. And it would be a list of things to politicians, not telling them what to do, but saying, if you hold any of these positions, we will not vote for you. In other words, making the politicians come to the, peop the, the uh, orthodox views on, on whatever those issues were. Now, that's a really messy sort of thing to try and figure out. Um, maybe the, um, you know, you could t think about who would come together to try and put something together like that. That was one idea that he had that he actually wrote and published in his own name. Um, he was very, he wrote a, a, an essay called Meditation on the Third Commandment, which for him was the commandment to blaspheme, you know, it would be blaspheming, and, and he was very worried about politics becoming 
um, blasphemous in the, in the sense that people were saying, thus saith the Lord. So the answer for him, um, he, he, was, he does not have a, a blueprint or an answer. Um, he, I think he kind of leaves that for us to try and figure out. Yeah. Other questions? I can tell you a story about his wife. No, good question. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm Caroline. I'm studying art, um, and I'm from South Bend. But um, I guess I just had a question because he talks a little bit in the um, in the Weight of Glory about like fairy stories. Um, and I know uh, I'm taking a class on Tolkien right now, and we read a poem which Tolkien wrote in response to, I believe Lewis said. Um, to Tolkien that myths are lies even if breathed through silver and therefore like false and, and, and bad. Mm -hmm. um, and to which Tolkien responded that myth, that the creation of myth is kind of a taking part in the creation of God and is, is one of the sort of higher things that, that men can do um, is to be united with creation in that way. So I guess I just wonder what exactly Lewis thought about myth and fairy stories. Lewis came around to Tolkien too. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the, when Lewis was, was religious as a child, his mother dies of cancer when he's I think around 10. Um, he loses his faith. Uh, um, and some of his early poetry is actually quite angry with God. Uh, when he gets to Oxford and befriends Tolkien and some others, um, one of Lewis's uh, beliefs is that to, he thought that to be a Christian had, had to mean believing everything else was completely false. Right, that every other, and Tolkien, one of Tolkien's responses was, no, um, what you have to believe is that Christianity is the true myth, but the other one, it's not like a binary, completely true or completely false, um, and that when you look at the other myths, they both love Norse mythology. I'd, be, I'd love to know what they think about Thor, Ragnarok, and these crazy <laughs> Marvel movies, right? Um, but they, they both love Norse mythology and other, and other mythology of all kinds, um, and, and Tolkien convinced Lewis to see um, these other stories as hints of the true story coming. So when, when, when Lewis was studying about the, the dying corn king and these other, other cultures, where he had a story about a god who dies and then comes up again, and, and one way of thinking about that is, well, gosh, Christianity is just copying that. that you, can, you can do a sort of genealogy of religion where you're saying it's just developing and, that, and they just grabbed it. Or you can think that, um, that God was planting seeds, right, and that we finally see... Uh, the true myth, and, and we actually have someone um, who seems to have actually lived that out. Uh, and that gets into some of Lewis's apologetics, right? Uh, why do we think that Jesus would be the one who lived it out? Well, um, the alternatives, if he's not the one who did it, and this is where Lewis has this kind of famous trilemma, he either must be a liar or a lunatic, right? And Lewis's own account of reading the scriptures and the gospels was, he sure doesn't seem crazy, and he seems to be of such a moral quality that it's really hard to think that he was lying about all that. Um, so, so it's a yeah, it's a great um, development and part of their friendship. Um, but Lewis came to to uh, to I think come over to Tolkien's side, although they still disagreed about it a lot. Tolkien really did not like the Chronicles of Narnia, um, and uh, and and later when when Lewis uh, would bring his wife Joy to the Inklings meetings, Tolkien wasn't too keen on that, um, from what I understand. Uh, so they had a bit of a falling out to, to some extent, um, but once uh, Joy died, they reconciled, and um, I think Tolkien won that. Um, I don't mean it like that. Sorry. <laughs> what I mean is, when she did die, Tolkien like took that moment to reestablish the friendship and reach out. Okay. Sorry. Um, anyway, so yeah, great, great question. I'll stop talking now. Other questions? Hi, I'm J.P. Geshwin. I'm a senior studying the program of liberal studies from Reading, Connecticut. Uh, I'm just curious why Lewis was so pessimistic, especially at the end of his life. Lewis was persuaded um, that democracy destroys education. Uh, Lewis was persuaded that, so if you've read Tocqueville, one of Tocqueville's concerns is that um, if you have a democracy, democracy is going to squelch excellence. Right. Uh, the more pop culture version of this is The Incredibles by Pixar. Right. The incredible people who are squelched, and you have Mr. Incredible, with whom I relate sometimes, who's squeezed in this teeny cubicle and can't really exercise his greatness. Uh, Lewis thought that um, there are two ways that you can think about equality, one good and one bad. The good way is that everyone should have a fair shot. And he believed in legal and economic equality to some extent. 
Uh, but the bad way of thinking about equality is, is, is that which prompts you to say to someone else, I'm as good as you. And that's what he was worried about. That democracy, his concern was, can you have the forms of democracy legally without it leading into a cultural democracy that is death? Uh, and he has these, this, these essays I was mentioning before, the truly good things in life are not democratic. They reward effort, they reward virtue, they reward those who will put in those things to try and achieve them, whether it's beauty or uh, intellect or um, holiness. Um, and so that was his, that was his concern. And, and uh, if you read The Abolition of Man, um, now that is uh, tougher sledding, it's, it gets it's some tough sledding philosophy. At the beginning he's talking about children's textbooks, right? Um, and he's basically, he's, he's, he takes this, this textbook, these poor guys sent to him actually, the publisher sent, to it, sent it to him, and he, and he puts an assumed name on it, but he basically says, these textbooks are teaching English school children not to say, uh, to, to interpret things by, by virtue of their own feelings, right? To say um, that when you look at the waterfall, um, someone says it's sublime, someone else says it's pretty, you can't say that the sublime description is objectively better. They're both just describing interior states of themselves. Um, in other words, this is, this is the predecessor to what is now rampant on college campuses with students telling me I feel things. You don't feel, well you do feel things, you feel hungry, you feel tired, you feel sleepy. You don't feel that Plato's allegory of the cave is about this, that, or the other. You think that, right? So Lewis in there is, is worried that we, we become, um, if you think about Plato's tripart, we have a head, chest, stomach, that we're basically, um, we're, evis we we're cutting out the connection between the two. Um, which is why he ends the abolition of man saying that we, we create men without chests and we laugh at virtue and are surprised by traitors in our midst and, and we um, build, bid the geldings be fruitful. Um, so he looked around and just saw um, he was very discouraged. Yeah. So again, um, yeah, yeah. If you know Professor Deneen's work, uh, they are of like mind. So I'm uh, Luke, a uh, sophomore studying economics and art history from San Antonio. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you, what you think or what Lewis considered to have been his, what, what was he most proud of? Which of the four Lewises that you mentioned would he have like, considered to be his most important co uh, contributions? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Lewis did not want to think much about himself. When he was in his 20s, before he was a Christian, he was very, he was obsessed with his stature and getting his poetry out and becoming a man of stature, being going to Oxford Dawn. And then as he achieved accolades, he was very well aware of what that did to him. So in terms of humility, he did not want to think about himself much. Um, so I, I don't think that he's, he, would, he would ever, I don't know that he's ever written about that, what, what am I most proud of. His favorite books of his own were Paralandra and Till We Have Faces. Till We Have Faces, he wrote with his wife, uh, Joy, um, and she helped him out a great deal with that. It's a, it's a remaking of the Cupid um, myth. Um, so I, I, I don't know. He, he was a remarkably generous man. When he gave, um, when he wrote, I think it was Screwtape Letters. I could be wrong about this, so if there's any Lewis people who hear this, and I could be wrong. But I think he, I think he was given a certain amount for each letter, or it might have been another thing he wrote, and basically, he just gave it all away. He instructed them, send it to this widow, that widow, give it all away, and then he got actually taxed for it, okay? <laughs> he hadn't paid his taxes because he, he, he counted his income, so then he set up uh, basically an account, basically two-thirds of all his income he never saw, it just went away. Um, he answered every letter that he was written, every letter, um, until he got to and then his brother helped him by dictating. So, so I, I don't know, I, I tend to think of, um, he was a remarkably generous man, in addition to being of this, this elevated stature of this, this, this author and this uh, very accomplished person, um, he interacted with, with regular folks who weren't Oxford Don type people. Um, he also took care of, um, I guess one of the things I, that I think is admirable about him, when he went off to fight in World War I, he went off with a, a man named Patty Moore, each of whom had a parent who'd lost their spouse. So uh, Lewis's mom had died, Patty Moore, uh, his dad had died, and they made a pact with each other. If either of us dies, the other one will take care of the, the remaining parent. Well, Patty Moore died. And so Lewis inherited Janie Moore um, and, uh, and took care of her. Um, uh, there's some delicate personal details about that with Lewis, with Lewis before he was a Christian, but basically took care of her until she'd passed away. 
Um, and, and she turned out to be a very difficult person to take care of. Um, so he was trying to support her, do his work, take care of his brother, who also had his own personal challenges, while doing all these, the speaking, writing, book, all this stuff, uh, answering letters to Americans who pestered him about it. I mean, it was just, so I, I think he, he, he lived a, a very generous life. Um, I, I'd say that, would, for me, that's what I would, I, I kind of admire about him. I'm not sure what he would say. Organizer's privilege and ask a question. I'm Patrick Deneen. I'm a very, very advanced student, but will never graduate. Uh, and I actually want to ask a question about Weight of Glory, uh, the, the sermon that we read together. Uh, um, but it was a little while ago. Uh, that I was particularly taken with and very moved by the conclusion, uh, the last set of uh, passages. I'll, I'll read a little bit of this just to remind us. Um, he, he says, um, it may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can bear it and the backs of the proud will be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. Uh, he writes further on, and our charity must be a real and costly love, a deep feeling for the sins in spite of which we love the sinner. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. And for days after I read this, this was constantly on my mind. I'd go to the supermarket, and there'd be the person in front of me who couldn't get their wallet out until like five minutes after everything had been rung up. Like, is this a surprise that you're going to have to pay for this? Nope. <laughs> this person may be a god or goddess. I am going to, uh, you know, all the daily irksome activities and behaviors of your neighbor. I have to admit, it didn't last much more than a few days after I'd read this. And I began to think back to this and think, I'm actually not, maybe not a very good Christian because it's hard to keep this constantly in mind. And I'm wondering, I mean, this is a very difficult standard for any human being to bear. So I guess one, one question I have is, did, did Lewis think of himself as a good Christian by the standard that he gives us here? Did he reflect on this? Is it possible to be a good Christian? Or is it a kind of, in some ways, an unattainable standard that's constantly something to which we aspire, perhaps, but it's always difficult to live in a constant, you know, selfless manner of, of thinking about the, you know, the possible divinity of, of the neighbors that annoy us and that irk us. And, the, you know, if you live in a dormitory, you probably have to live this daily, if not, you know, by right. the minute. So I, that's a kind of big question, but, um, you know, maybe as a response to the sermon or his own thinking or writing, um, is it possible to be, in this sense, a good Christian, or are we always, in a sense, you know, falling well short of the, of the goal? So Lewis addresses pride in mere Christianity and, and, says, or, and humility. And the, the humbler you are, the less you'll actually be thinking of yourself, regardless. So in one sense, it's good for us to take inventory of how we're doing, right, to be, think about what, how we're doing spiritually. Um, and, and Lent is a particularly good time to be doing that. Right, that's why we have these practices that, that, that make us realize, oh, we're not quite as holy as we may have thought we were um, when, we give up, when we give up things that are, that are actually good. Uh, but he says either you will come, the truly humble person will either forget herself entirely or just think herself as, as, as a small, dirty object. Now, that's actually a little bit in intention with, with the sermon here right, in terms of what we're supposed to be at some point. Um, I don't, I think, you know, I, I guess... I, let me let me let me cheat a little bit by going to the, the Chronicles of Narnia. There's there's a scene in which um, Lucy is the only one who can see Aslan. The others don't see her and they don't believe her. When he when he when she sees him, she thinks he looks a lot bigger, and she says, um, "Aslan, have you grown since I've seen you?" And his, his response is something like, well, "No, you see me better now." Right? It's not that he's gotten bigger; it's that she can see him better. And I and I think if you get more holy. You're getting more holy by virtue of becoming closer to God and knowing him better. If you do think about yourself, the better you know God, the more you're going to realize how far you fall short of. So I don't know. Um, I think it's possible to be a good Christian, but I don't think it's a sort of question that we would be asking ourselves as we were journeying along that way. 
At least I don't think Lewis would think so. I think you would be you'd be too busy thinking about the the other things, right? Um, it's like what now? Not to you know what's Augustine's response to the question about what God was doing before time? Uh, something like he was creating hell for those who asked those questions. Uh, <laughs> is it something like that? Um, so I don't know. It's quite like that, but I, I do think he would he would punt on on the question um, that we're better off. Uh, f- trying to be um, trying to be better than, than gauging our progress on it. Do I think it's possible? Yeah, I think I think um, I am. Not, I know myself well enough to know I'm not that person. But I, I mean, haven't we all met people and you go away thinking there's something about that person um, that's. And this is why Lewis was not egalitarian, particularly spiritual. There are higher and lower people, and we do well to admire the folks that are further along and closer to God. And if you read the Great Divorce. Heaven is not egalitarian. It's a hierarchy, and there are holy people. And he has this one passage in The Great Divorce. Where there's this, this great lady who comes, and she speaks with the, the dwarf and the ghost, and there's a train of people following her, this great procession. And Lewis asks his guide, who's George MacDonald, well, who was she on earth? You would have never heard of her. She's a regular person who, who took care of her family and had lots of, uh, it was very charitable, took care of animals. I mean, she, she, but she wasn't famous in any way, but she was great. Um, and so I guess I don't think that, I guess that's my, my long-winded answer. That I'm not sure he would he would he would take it on as an answer. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm very extremely pleased. Uh, uh, first of all. Thank you for that very stimulating talk. And, and I think um, uh, while you're our guest here, uh, you're the occasion for us also to, to form more of a community among, among ourselves. And so for that, we're also grateful. So I, w- I would like to express my own gratitude, and I'd ask you to join me in expressing our gratitude to our guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.